everyone. This is Arlen Salty, the co-director and co-founder of Breakforth Ministries. Before we jump into this episode, my wife Elsa and I would love to invite you to head over to BreakforthMinistries.com where you can find out about our live events, our tours to the Holy Land resources, and so much more. And if you feel you'd like to help us out with the cost of putting Breakforth online out to the world for free, you can choose to support the ministry there as well. Don't feel pressure, but even $5 helps to keep us expanding this free library. Okay, let's get right to today's episode. This is Bible Study Skills Discover Truth for Yourself by K. Arthur and David Arthur. This is part two of a four part series. Okay, let's go. All right, so some good questions. Uh, uh, one person asked, um, why, why did you pick the phrase, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet? I failed to mention this. You look, the first step is you look for repeated phrases, repeated words and phrases. So it's not that every time I study the Old Testament, I'm looking for the phrase, the word of the Lord came by. Okay, that will be in several of the prophets, but I'm looking, I'm letting the text determine what I'm to look for. And that's why we simply just read through the text, read through the text, and you begin to see things repeated. As something's repeated, then you say, all right, I want to now pay attention to that. Right, another great question that was asked on the break was, is, um, can you talk a little bit more about why you mark keywords? Uh, this person's uh, class is struggling with getting just the right colors, just the right diagrams and shapes and the words, and they seem to miss the point. Here's the deal about keywords and marking keywords. It slows you down. Oh my goodness, that's worth the whole seminar workshop price right there. It slows you down. Working your way with a pen in your hand keeps you from rushing through the text and coming up with assumptions that perhaps are not in the text. It slows you down. If you were to read Philippians four times, I guarantee you, you would not say, I can be a cheerleader because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because you would have read chapter four, four times, and he's very clear, I, I'm content with having nothing. I'm content with having a lot. I can do all things which is now defined by the context of being without or being with a lot. I can do all things through Christ. It doesn't mean achieving things at all. Where two or three are gathered together to, there in, my, in, in the midst. I mean, if two or three are gathered together in my name, I will be there in your midst. You ever use that for a prayer meeting? You know, that would be to rip the text right out of its context. It's about discipline. In Matthew 18, Jesus is talking about, I'm, you know, I'll be one of the witnesses against this guy. He's not talking about, uh, it's the time to get together and pray, and I'll be there in your midst. It sounds so good. It works really well, but it's not in the Bible. That's out of context. So marking keywords, it, what it does is it gets you to interact with the text, which is so important, and it gets you to slow down. Uh, and think and reason through and doing that. So you don't want to get caught up on colors and markings. Uh, you don't want to make it a jigsaw puzzle where you're simply just looking for the word Jesus and marking Jesus. Because Jesus. if you get finished and your Bible's all marked up, but you don't know the text, you have missed the point. Right? It's a workbook, your Bible. Something you're, you're wrestling with, you're interacting with in that. Okay, so great, great questions. All right, so let's pick back up. We were looking at this first message. And uh, so let's talk about what this message, what is, what is, and the first message, by the way, is what verses? Chapter one, verse one through, okay, I've got somebody saying verse 14 or 15, any other ideas? Okay, and another idea is verse 11. Okay, so any other ideas? Oh, let me just point to it. What's verse three say? Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, Okay, so is that, that's a, a repeated phrase, right? That's the same phrase we read in verse 1. So it looks like verse 3 starts another message. So what we have is, is the first message is only two verses long. All right, that makes it easy. So we're now, we've brought the plane down. We're now looking at the text a bit closer. Uh, what, is, what is the message in chapters 1, verses 1 to 2 about? Obvious. Give me obvious now. The time has not come for what? Yeah, that's what, that's what is what, what's, what is that message? 
Okay, so let's let's be very careful. Look at the text. What the, it, is God saying? It's not time for you to rebuild my house. The people are saying. So you, you, you've marked people, right? So you, you can see the people are saying, right? It's not time uh, for it to be rebuilt. So what is the what's the great grand message of this first two verses? It's real simple. The people think. It's not time to rebuild the temple, right? Do you see how simple that is? You're not trying to come up with a meaning and interpretation. All you're simply doing is recording the facts. So message one, the people say, not time to rebuild the house of the Lord. Okay, so good. It's a good question, brother. So let's look at it again. Uh, Verse two says, thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says... So what do the people say? Okay, so what is the what is the people's message? It's not time to rebuild. What's God's message? Is what they're saying, right? Does that make sense? So look at it again. Sometimes it helps just to go slow and read the verse again. Verse 2 says, "Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says, quote, the time is not come even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt." Okay, so what's the message that God gives through the prophet Haggai to the people? I've heard that the people say it's not time to rebuild. You agree now? Is that good? Okay. So let's look at the next message. Where's the next message? Right? Didn't find how how was it so easy for y'all to find that? You marked the you marked the phrase what? The word of the Lord came, right? So you see, when you mark those phrases, literally, guys, the outline of the text begins to jump off the page. You don't need those headers that people put into Bibles to tell you what's what the paragraph breaks are. What the You've got it because you've just discovered it. Now, what you're holding in your hands, by the way, is literally a copy of the inductive study Bible, the new inductive study Bible. This is a study Bible we've had out now since 1990-something, <laughs> early 90s. Uh, and this is a study Bible that has no commentary in it, never tells you what things mean, but it gives you detailed instructions on how to inductively study every single verse of the Bible. So there's a, and, so, and all I'm doing for our exercise is I'm simply reading you the instructions out of the Bible. And we're just doing it together just to show you how simple and basic this is. Okay, so you've marked the next phrase. Let's look at this message just for a second. What is this message? Verse 3, when the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, quote, verse 4, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house, did you mark this house? Right, this house refers to the temple, while this house lies desolate. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with what? Holes, right? So you get the visual image there. You're putting money in your pocket, and where's it going? Right down your pant leg or your dress leg or whatever they wore, (laughs) right? That drops to the ground. Thus says the Lord of hosts, verse 7, consider your ways. Okay, the message continues, doesn't it? Verse 8, go up to the mountains, bring wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it, it, the temple, and be glorified, says the Lord. You people look for much, but it com- but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I, God, blow it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts. He answers the question, doesn't he? Because of my house, which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. I call for drought. On the land, God, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, and what the ground produces, on men, on cattle, on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God 
and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people showed reference for the Lord. Now look at verse 13. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people, saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. Do you see that change in the pattern in verse 13? Right? You might not catch that the first time, and that's okay. You're going to be reading, when you study the Bible, you're going to be reading it over and over again. But you might pick up that verse 13 seems to be another message coming by God in that. So that would mean that the second message starts in what verse? Verse 3, and it goes down to verse 12. All right, so let's take that as a block, and let's examine that text. Um, so as we, as we look at this, what do you have already marked up all over that message? What are the markings you've got there? People, temple, okay, and the word of the Lord. Excellent. Okay, so you've got those, those are the three things. Do you, did you pick up on any other repeated phrases? Oh, excellent. Consider your ways. What verses do you see that? Verse 5 and verse 7. Okay, so remember earlier we were talking about, should you mark that in the same way as the word of the Lord came by the prophet of Haggai? Do you see now why if you did, that might confuse it a bit, if you're looking for the pattern? Because it's not the same repeated phrase, although there are some similarities, it's not the same. Now we see that thus consider your ways is part of... The second message. Does that make sense? Uh, In doing that. Again, if you miss that, that's not a big deal. Okay, don't don't get hung up. uh, Don't get uh, uh, perfectionistic uh, in your uh, your observations. Don't worry. The more you observe, the more you'll understand. All right, so let's look. So so let's mark that phrase, consider your way. So uh, just just draw you a box around it or something like that. All right, so verse 5, and what was the other one? Verse 7. Okay, so we've got two times where God says, uh, all right, so any other repeated uh, words in there? The house lies desolate. Okay, where do you see that? Verse 4 and verse 9. Excellent. The house lies desolate. Now, you've already marked house, right, um, uh, as, as temple, but you got now you have an additional phrase, desolate, or, or lies desolate. Good. What other key words do you see that's repeated? <laughs> enough. All right, where do you see enough? Okay, verse 6. Oh, you see it a couple times in verse 6. Good, yeah. You see it anywhere else? I had not picked up on that one. Okay. How does How is God described in this? The Lord of hosts, all right? Do you see the Lord of hosts a couple times in this text? All right, where do you see it? Let's start at the top. Start at verse 3. All right, verse 5. Okay, so here's a clue. When you see God give himself a name like that, where he doesn't just say God, but you see like the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty, or the Lord the Shepherd, or, you know, the uh, Lord our righteousness. If anytime you see that, go ahead and mark that, because it's whole. Oh, you can't fail marking God in God's revelation. So let's do that. Let's go ahead, take you, um, and what we suggest is um, a triangle for, um, for God, because He is three in one. Uh, and so, um, so I simply just go through and put a, a triangle. And if you're a color person, you might color it gold or something like that. Again, it's your preference, okay? The Lord of hosts. So I've got verse 5. Where's the next one? Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, okay? Verse 9, right there in the middle. Verse what? Verse 2 has it. Thank you. Oh, it does? The Lord of hosts? Am I looking right at it? Verse 2. I'm looking right at it. <laughs> I'm looking at verse 1, thinking I'm looking at verse 2. Yes, good, good job. So that's good. So what she just said is good. I've noticed a repeated phrase for God, the Lord of hosts. All right, I want to go back and make sure I don't miss that. So she went back to, to, to verse 2 of chapter 1. Okay, so we left off at of verse 9. Where's the next one? Okay, verse 14. 
Lord of hosts there at the end. I'm sorry. In verse 5. Yeah, we, we got that one already. So I'm, if I'm looking at chapter 1, I'm seeing verse 2, 5, 7, 9, and 14. Did, did I miss any? All right, there's one, two, three, four, five times in, in 14 verses, God refers to himself as the Lord of hosts. That might be something, not now, because we're still in, in our overview mode, but that might be something you want to go back and look. What does he mean, Lord of hosts? What does Lord of hosts mean? You would simply go to your concordance. You would look up in your concordance, Lord of hosts. You would begin to look at other ways it's used. Then you might then take the next step and go look at a Bible dictionary. Any Bible dictionary do. There's free ones on the internet. Blue Letter Bible, E Sword, um, lots of lots of things out there you can find on the internet for free. And you go look that up and see what does Lord of the Hosts mean. Um, and then it would be fun once you define that meaning, then to bring that meaning back to the text and say, how does that apply to what's going on here? It'd be, I don't want to steal any joy from you. It's really cool, though. By the way, when you see what Lord of Hosts mean and you see it in the context. Uh, here of Haggai. All right, any other keywords jumped out at you? No. All right, so let's talk about this message. Uh, we're now we're looking only at verses three to verse twelve. Um, what, what what is the first half of this message? How's that working out for you? Very good. <laughs> I don't read that in the text, but I get what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, what would be the phrase that would be, how's that working out for you? Consider your ways, right? We've seen that twice in this text. All right. So what is their ways? What's going on here? What's the, what's the false message that they have? They're being selfish. How do you, where did you get that? Because the word selfish isn't in the text. What, what's the phrase that leads you to that? Okay, you got to speak nice and loud for him. Sorry. Yeah, they're saying there's not enough. They're living in their penal houses. Okay, so how would you compare their house to God's house? What? Yeah, paneled houses. In his lies desolate. Okay, so that sounds different to me. One house is paneled. Now, I know paneling's not as hip as it used to be, but it used to be really cool back in the 70s, right? Now it's wallpaper or something like that. Uh, paneled houses, their houses are paneled, God's house is desolate, all right? And what's their message that they, that they are promoting in, in the first message that we saw? It's not time to rebuild. Do you see any reasons why they would say it's not time to rebuild uh, in uh, their, their houses? Say again, nice and loud. They're in want. Okay, so what's their condition like? There's a drought. Excellent. Where did the drought come from? God brought a drought? Okay. He called for a drought. What did he call the drought on? Yeah, now look at verse 11. Here's what we have, what we call a simple list. A simple list. And this is so good. You want to literally write these down. I know they're in the text, but you want to transfer them to a margin in your Bible or to a piece of paper. God calls for a drought on, number one, say it, land. Number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, what the ground produces. Number seven, ooh, number eight. And number nine. Okay, so why are they, as our brother said over here, why are they in want? God's not only not blessing them, what is he doing? (laughs) He's taking, right? He's taking from them. I called for a drought on. And then you've got your nine list and your nine point list there. So why do they not have enough? Okay, because, now look at verse 9, excellent. When you see the word because, that answers what kind of question? Who, what, when, where, why, and how? Why? Because, right? Your kids ask this all the time. Why? You say because. (laughs) Because I said so. (laughs) I hated that. Now I say it all the time. 
Yeah, because. Well, because why? Because God's house is desolate. What's the next phrase there, verse 9? While each of you, what? Runs to his own house. All right, so what is, what's the command here of this message? What's the instruction? Rebuild the temple. Okay. Need to change your focus. And what is the phrase that you get that from? Consider your ways. God says it twice. Consider your ways. They look at their situation and they're losing, right? Business is not working. Uh, their wives are not fertile. The, the cattle aren't reproducing. Uh, they, they're having, they, they see that they cannot afford, now they think they cannot afford to go and rebuild this a very expensive building project. Why? Because they don't think they have anything. But what have they been spending their money on? Themselves. Wow. Now there's, there's a message we've just done observation on. Let's talk about interpretation just for a minute. How would you interpret that message? Not apply yet, but how would you, what is the meaning of the fact that they have not built God's house? God's house is desolate. They've built themselves their own houses, but now nothing seems to be working for them. What's going on there? It's about priorities. Right? What else is it about? Whose priorities? They haven't obeyed God's priorities, right? Say again. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that'd be another. Oh, that's yeah, another great thing. If we've marked all those peoples. It would be good to go make a list on what do we learn about these peoples, right? And so you got verses like verse six, right? What what do they have in verse six? They've sown, but they harvest little, right? They eat, but they're never. They drink, but they're never <laughs> drunk. Clothing, but nobody's warm, right? So, what is God saying to them? Say it nice and loud for me. Your efforts are fruitless unless unless you put him first. All right, what happens in this message? How do the people respond? And show me the verse. Okay, verse 12. Okay, they showed reverence. What else do they do? How do they show reverence? They obeyed. They obeyed the voice of the Lord and the words of Haggai the prophet. Excellent. And they showed reverence. Uh, now, we could, we'll cheat just a minute. Let's look at the next message, uh, starting in verse 13. Then Haggai the messenger of the Lord spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people, saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Worked on the house of the Lord of God. <laughs> We've got a teacher over here. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So we got a comma. On the, good. Thank you, mom. On the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. All right, so what, what's this third message? They started rebuilding. And what, it, and what was God's relationship with them like? He's with them. What does it mean when God says, I'm with you? You got his favor, right? You got his provision, his protection. Right? And they came and they worked on it. Do you know when that happened? On the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. Anybody uh, challenge when it comes to calendars and dates and things like that? And kings and the reigns of kings? Yeah, I am. All right, so we've got in your on your book there, look in your, uh, on that chart there called the Jewish calendar. All right, so this would be, now what we've done is we're, we're, I'm going to stop, we're going to stop working our way through the, uh, through every message. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, all right, so what do you do next? After you've gone and you've observed, 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 you've marked, you read, you've made your list, right? You're working through it. Now what you want to do is you want to begin to do some interpretations and figure out some things. So now we're going to take another step. We're going to look and say, well, we realize that these people, what kind of people are, is he talking to? 
what nationality? The Jews, right? And we, we know it's around the year of King who? Darius, all right? So we could go plug that in and find out. Um, so before, I'm sorry, before you look at the Jewish calendar, look at that rulers and prophets of Haggai's time. Okay, now all this is, this is indisputable. Okay, so this is not an interpretation. Uh, unless you're just a crazy liberal, uh, you would agree with this time timeline. Uh, and even most liberals agree with it. So, um, But if you look at this timeline, all we've done is we've taken three layers through there. So you see that top layer is called Kings of Persia. Y'all see that? All right, so, so leading, leading from left to right, uh, we've got the year uh, 539, fall of Babylon, and leading at that time uh, uh, is Cyrus. You see at the top there? When did he lead from? From what to what? 539 to 530. Okay, so now you know how to read that chart. All right, who else is in charge there? Darius the Mede, and he led from... 539 to 525. Okay, so as you're working your way across that top, you see the kings of Persia. We'll put up there the the foreign kings oftentimes. This is what the history books uh, that most uh, scholars would agree to. This is this is good common uh, history that goes across. The middle line is the books of the Bible, where they fit. Okay, so we've got, um, uh, so we've got, can anybody find the book of Haggai? Right? So, so what are the dates there on the book of Haggai? 520 to 505. Now, why in the world do you think we know it was 520 to 505? I can't read. I'm sorry, my eyes are bad. Why in the world do we know that? Yeah, because somebody's mentioned, right? So, can you find Darius around that same time frame? Go back up to the kings of Persia. Right? What do you, what do you see there? When, when is Darius reigning? 521, right? And you see a little uh, little black thing with temple in it. What did you see there? The temple is what? Finished. Now look to your left. When did the temple stop? 534. Now here's a, here's a question for you. If I want to know about the stopping of the work of the temple, what book of the Bible would I go learn? Ezra. Excellent. And do you know what chapters I would look at? Yeah, you would go look at one to six. It's going to be in there somewhere, right? So if we wanted to know a little bit more about these time phrases and what's going on, what book would we go study? Ezra. Excellent. You would and you would study chapters one to six, right? In doing so, is there any other books of the Bible that would be parallel to Haggai? Using this chart. Zechariah. Excellent. So what do you see what you have here is you've got a simple way to say, now I can go build some historical context. Uh, and so if we wanted to take the time, we would go to Ezra and we would read. Now, I'll just tell you, the, uh, if you want to write this down um, uh, in there, if you have an inductive study Bible, uh, the instruction would be to get the historical setting of Haggai, read Ezra 4, verse 24 through 6 verse 22. Now, let me just tell you, this is, this is not a scholarly uh, a commentary. This is God's Word. This, we're still using the primary source of information. Right, so we're still looking at that. So what we find out, let me just uh, let me just give you a little clue, uh, but for sake of time, because uh, we want to move on. But let me just give you a little clue. It looks like the people of God have been released from exile, the punishment of God. They've been given resources by King Cyrus, a lot of money and trees and gold and all kinds of stuff. Ezra has a great story about this. So they come, they get back, and it just kind of. It just kind of fades away and they get, they get kind of upset and discouraged and they stop working on the house of God. The whole reason why Cyrus gave the decree, the whole reason why all these resources were done, when you get to Haggai, what are the, what's the condition of the people? What do you know about the people? What do you know about the people? <laughs> she went straight to it. They've spent it on themselves, right? Where do they get the paneling from? Where do they get the resources to go do their elaborate homes? Probably from 
Cyrus's gift, which was intended for the house of God. So you see, just by looking at now, all we're doing is is cross-referencing. We're just looking at other passages of Scripture to say, what else can we learn to add to this puzzle? And we simply can begin to build a a clear understanding of the book of Haggai. Now, you've got several more messages, uh, and we'll leave that for you to go uh, and to look at. And you've marked them now, so now you can go and do that. And now we've cross-referenced. Now let me show you one other aspect. Uh, look at your at-a-glance chart. Haggai at-a-glance chart. All right, so this is something Mom picked up uh, and revised from a guy named Irving Jensen, uh, who was a professor at Bryan College uh, back in the days where the Scopes Monkey Trial was. I don't know if y'all remember this, uh, historians. Uh, but uh, an at-a-glance chart is simply a, a blank chart to help you put in paragraph or chapter divisions, segment divisions, keywords, and and that. So it's just simply a format for you to do. Now, I'll just go ahead and tell you, every book of the Bible in the Inductive Study Bible has one of these. Uh, And so I can just tell you, when you come up with your own chapter themes and your own segment themes, the bigger blocks of chapters, it sticks. I I can tell you today, Romans. And I didn't memorize an outline from my professors in seminary. I know Romans because I've gone through and I've plugged in everybody. I've done the work. I'm telling you, it just sticks with you. And I've been called upon, I don't know if this happens to you, but I've been called upon spontaneously to preach or to speak or to teach. I was literally uh, with, a, with a precept group and they, they were studying Second Peter and they were in chapter 3 and they said, hey, why don't we turn the video off and since we got David Arthur, David, will you teach us Second Peter 3? So what did I do? I pulled out Second Peter. I looked at my at-a-glance chart. I saw the themes of each chapter that I had already discovered for myself. It came back to me, and I taught chapter 3. I got my paragraph divisions. I've done the text. I was ready. Not because I'd memorized some outline or some guy's sermon or, you know, strategy for attacking chapter 3. I've dug it myself. And so I was Johnny on the spot, ready to go. Got an email uh, last night. I'm going to Seattle next week, uh, and I've been asked to speak on the names of God, God, Lord, I want to know you, and Jehovah Ra'ah, no, what's the shepherd? Roy, is it Roy? <laughs> I haven't even done the homework yet. So, you know, so, but I'm going to go back to my, my text, I'm going to look up the text where Jehovah Roy is mentioned, and I guarantee you, I've marked it up, and I've got my outlines already there. You're ready. This is a working tool that you have. So this at a glance chart. So you look there, uh, and what, because it's so short, we didn't just have chapters. We thought let's break it up by paragraphs. Okay, so we've got paragraphs, and, and now paragraphs can be, you know, it, this is not a hard and fast uh, paragraph break. Um, but if you look at, we've kind of broken up into chunks for you. So chapter one, verse one to eleven, and here's how you come up with a paragraph theme or a chapter theme. You simply say, "What is it about?" You don't need to be cute. You don't need to be clever. It doesn't need to start with the same letter of the alphabet. It doesn't need to be, you know, two or three words. But it, I would, I would recommend using words of the text and saying, what is, what's going on here? So let me just, I'll just tell you one. Uh, my, my, uh, my paragraph theme is the problem is the house is unfinished. The consequence is the people are suffering and the solution is to obey. Now, isn't that cool? I could, I now can go teach. Paragraph one, one to eleven. I got, I've got my three points right there. I've got it. I've got an outline. I can do it. I've marked the text. I know the text now. I can do that. Well, I've got that because I've got this at a glance chart. Um, now look at the chapter themes because there's only two chapters, um, and we can't fill that out because we haven't studied it yet. But you would put in what you would say is the theme, the main idea, what's about of chapter one, and then what's chapter two about. Again, this needs to work for you. It needs to be something that serves you. So you don't want to copy other people's paragraph themes. That would be cutting, that'd be cheating. <laughs> Thank you. That would, that's cutting, that's, you're missing the whole point of the exercise, right? The point of inductive Bible study is for you to discover the truth for yourself, uh, not to memorize somebody else's. And so that's oftentimes why we'll, we'll uh, you know, get frustrated when people say, you know, we want to see Kay's Bible. In fact, that's how this Bible came about was some publishers said, hey, we want to publish the K. Arthur Study Bible. After she gagged a couple times, 
and said, you don't get me. That's not what I'm about. That's not what precept is about. We don't want you to read our study notes. We want you to study. It's a verb, for heaven's sakes, not a noun. <laughs> right? Most study Bibles, it's a noun. And you're reading somebody else's study. This is where you study it. Uh, and so we don't want you to memorize K's paragraph themes and put them in your Bible. That would be to defeat the whole purpose, right? So as we look at this, um, uh, the last thing that you do in inductive Bible study, after you've You've observed the text. You've marked your key words and phrases. You've broken up your text into chunks, and you've gone further and looked at it, continue to mark them up. You've made your interpretations, and then you begin to look for applications. The last thing you do in inductive Bible study, and this is important, is now you go check it against commentaries. Because let me just finish with an illustration, and then I'll, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, let's say uh, you're taking biology. Remember high school biology? Remember, come on, you remember high school biology, those, those wax, those wax trays, right? And the formaldehyde, I can still smell it, right? So let's say your biology teacher says, I got a deal for you. Here's, a, here's two options. You can, you can go through my entire semester, take all my, do all my homework, take all my quizzes, take all my exams, and I'll give you a grade. And you're like, well, then that's how it works, right? Yeah, okay. Or your professor, your teacher says, or you can write a paper, on all you know about frogs. And whatever grade you get, that will be your grade for the entire course. You don't have to come to class. You don't have to do homework. You don't have to do tests. Who's in for that? <laughs> Nobody's in for that? Come on. Yeah, there's a couple of you. Right, all right, come on. All right, so, so let's say you decide to go with option two, and you're going to write that paper. There's two ways you could do it. You could go to the library, spend a good six, eight hours, right? Totally worth it. Six, eight hours for a whole semester. You could get the book, A to Z, All I Know About Frogs. And you could read that book cover to cover, make notes, write up a paper, turn it in, get an A. In about six months, you probably forgot everything you studied. <laughs> or you could do the inductive approach which means you get a tent, a backpack, and some camping gear. You move out to the woods. You find a pond. You identify a tadpole. You follow the tadpole till legs pop out, tail goes away, water-born creature becomes an air-breathing creature. You follow around. You, now you've named him Freddy, Freddy the Frog. And you follow Freddy with your notebook and you observe everything about Freddy. It takes time. It takes days and days. And you watch Freddy. You watch what he eats. You watch how he sleeps. You watch his interaction with other frogs. You make note. Oh, he's got a girlfriend. He's licking the other frog behind the ears. Oh, that ears. Uh, that, yeah, that, uh, behind where ears would be, right? Oh, he's got a, he's got a mate, right? Oh, this is so sweet. This is Fredina. Freddy and Fredina, right? And you watch all this. And then you go to the library. And you read this book. No, I'm sorry. Before you go to the library, you take Freddie. <laughs> this is the sad part. You take Freddie into the lab. And you say a couple nice words about Freddie. And you give him a little ether treatment. And you pin his little legs back on the wax tablet. And you cut open little Freddie's belly. You pull out that fly. You saw the fly. You saw me eat the fly. And you pull out other things in there, right? You lay out his organs. You look at his little broken heart. Oh, it's so sad. It's got a crack in it. Right? You do all that work. You, I mean, you've, you've, you've really invested a lot in, in this frog. Then you go to the library. Then you read and you compare what you read with what you've observed. And you find out that licking up in that area is not a mating ritual. It's a cleaning ritual. And boys do boys and girls do girls. Ooh. Right? So you, you, you correct your observation and your interpretation because it was wrong, right? That's not a mating procedure. Ah, that's a cleaning procedure, right? So you make no, you you allow that commentary, you allow that that book to help you understand what you've done. Then you write your paper and you're done. Do you think you'll forget Freddie? That experience? Why? Why would you not forget Freddie? Time, energy, sweat, labor. You've lived in a tent for Freddie. Right? You've experienced Freddie's life as it happened. You didn't read about it. You were part of his life. The same way with inductive Bible study. All we want folks to do is to slow down and to take the time and to put in the energy and the effort to know God's word for themselves. And here's why. If you don't own it, you will not suffer for it. If it's not a part of you, you will not take risks. You will not suffer persecution for it because it belongs to somebody else. 
You have to know it for yourself if it's going to truly impact your life. So you can't say, I believe it because John Piper preaches it. Right? You can't say, I believe it because C.S. Lewis, right? Who loves C.S. Lewis? Right? Great guy. Do you know that C.S. Lewis didn't believe that some of the Psalms in the Bible were written by God? They call them the imprecatory Psalms. He said, there's no way that's from God. C.S. Lewis missed it. Martin Luther. Who loves Martin Luther? Any Presbyterians in the house? Right? Martin Luther, right? Martin Luther was a great guy. Do you know that he didn't think James was a part of the Bible? Because it conflicted with his interpretation of Romans and Galatians? So you can't lean upon other people's understandings. They will mess up. You can't lean on Kay Arthur's. Kay, is, is, if you come to one of her workshops, she's going to tell you she's changed her mind about Ezekiel 38. So have I. <laughs> you can't lean upon us. We're, we are not infallible and completely dependable people. We make mistakes. But you can depend upon God's Word and the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Uh, so this is... Just to summarize, this is a, an approach for the Old Testament. And we're not going to show you how to jump into the New Testament, but this is an approach for the Old Testament. You want to start by just looking, uh, what's the acronym again? Take a picture. It's a photo, which stands for focus on the obvious. And the obvious in an Old Testament book is often going to be people, places, and events. I'm telling you, you just start with that and the Bible comes alive. The book of Haggai, written to a people a long, long time ago, now has, and and I don't know about you, but I'm beginning to see there's things in my life that I need to be building that belongs to God and not myself. And I don't know about you in Canada, but in America, our 401ks are out the window. Our retirements are half the size they were before. And if I was depending upon my, for my security to be in my financial situation, I'm in trouble. Because it's not what it was. Wall Street has messed up. And I know there might be a couple Americans in here, but uh, and you Canadians hadn't hit this yet. Um, and, uh, and praise the Lord for that. Hopefully you're spending your money well. But if you're investing more in your houses, in your kingdoms, in your personal things, and less in the house of God, what should you expect from God according to the book of Haggai? Good or bad? Bad, right? If so, right now, if you're putting a lot of hard effort and energy into a business or to, an, uh, or to, or to a, some resources and you're finding complete failure, what might be something you want to go look at? Yeah, consider your ways, right? I had a friend one time who was in, who was in, in serious business debt, and he told me that he can't afford to give to the work of the kingdom until he gets his debt paid off. Do you know what book I took him to? Took him to Haggai. I said, brother, you, you should not expect to get your debt paid off if your money's going in the wrong direction. Who's in charge of your resources? Who calls for drought? Who calls for blessing? It is God and God alone, right? So a simple message uh, out of the book of Haggai. Thank you so much. He started doing this when he was a young boy. He started studying the Word of God. And I'm excited about uh, you being here. I'm excited about this afternoon. We're going to get into a New Testament epistle and that. But I wanted to tell you just about several things. One, this chart uh, is one of the most incredible things. We took it out of the inductive study Bible, and it's the history of Israel, a timeline. So any book of the Bible that you're in, you can see the other books that are during that time. You can see who the kings of the north were, the kings of the south were, if the kingdoms are existing. You can see who the foreign powers are, and you can put yourself in context. When we did the inductive study Bible, what we did in Haggai at a glance, the reason that we have those divisions is according to the messages. So the first message was the second year of Darius, the first day day, the sixth month. Second message, 12 to 15, was the 24th day, the sixth month. So that's the way we uh, divided it. And so then that puts you in history, then that enables you to go back and see what David was saying and, and just see what you're going to see as you study the Bible book by book, and that's the best way to study. You're going to
going to see the integration of, of the scriptures. You're going to see how it all fits together. You're going to see, as we were talking about when we were waiting in the line for the restroom, you're going to see the big picture. You're going to see the corners of the puzzle and then how it all fits together. And so many times I'm just having my quiet time and, and I, and I just stop and I'm overwhelmed. God, how awesome. How awesome is your word? And I read it and I think, God, nothing else really matters in life. Nothing else really matters except who you are and what you've said and, and, and that I know you and that I obey you. Daniel 1132b says this, the people who know their God will be able to stand firm and take action. And the reason that the church is falling apart collectively is because they don't know the Word of God. And most of them don't know the Old Testament. And see, most of the Bible is the Old Testament. That's where you meet God. So just as you go through and and mark Lord of hosts, as you go through and mark the people, and, and then you make a list of everything you see about the people, you see how are the people relating to the Word of God. That was Bible Study Skills, Discover Truth for Yourself, Part 2 of Four Parts by Kay Arthur and David Arthur. Okay, Part 3 is queued up and ready to go. So move on over to there as soon as you have a chance. In the meantime, you can check out precept.org for more resources. Thank you again for listening. We're adding more and more to this free online library of great sessions all the time. So remember to check back to see all the new content. And also remember, please head on over to BreakForthMinistries.com where you'll learn more about our live events, Break for Holy Land tours, and so much more. Okay, we'll catch you again for more sessions at Break Forth Online.